Hi, everybody. Welcome. Hello, hello. We see some familiar faces. Um, we're gonna, you know, give people a couple more minutes to uh, log in. Um, while we're waiting just for something interesting that's happened in the first meeting, and it was really fun. Uh, if you want to type in chat where you're joining us from, um, that would be so exciting to see uh, where all of our knitters are. Oh, Got yes, it's coming in. Oh, oh, exciting. <laughs> Georgia, Florida, Ohio, Rhode Island, Albuquerque, Colorado. This is very uh, all over the country. This is super exciting. It immediately just went whoosh all <laughs> over the states. Oh, Ontario. Super fun. Oh, Ontario, how exciting. Hello, Canada. <laughs> North Carolina, Colorado, Washington. It would be fun if we could actually make a map of just... These are where people came, came in from. <laughs> it'd be fun. Oh, another Ontario, more Canada. Yeah, it'd be very fun. I know I have um, two friends in person who I am knitting uh, the sweater with, and it's very fun when we manage to get together and compare our progress. So it's, it's nice to find a local knitter who's doing the knit along as well. Mm -hmm. California. What? Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Jaja and I are also in California, so. Yeah, near the West warehouse. Coast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, push pin map of all the places. That would be nice. Yes. We'll have to figure out something like that. Maybe in the newsletter. That'd be really cool. Ooh, I like that. Awesome. Indiana, New Jersey. How fun. All right, also, and while we're on gallery view and we can mm -hmm. all see each other, do you guys want to hold up your sweaters? Uh, oh, yeah. I made it to the body of my sweater. I'm so excited. Look at that, all those beautiful colors. I restarted. <laughs> <laughs> also fine. <laughs> gauge swatches, you can hold up a skein of yarn if you haven't even started your gauge swatch. Totally yeah. fine. <laughs> awesome. Okay. All right. Oh, I see some questions number. coming. Oh, the net. Somebody's here from the Netherlands. How exciting. Oh. Welcome. I know our first couple uh, Zoom and knits, we had some feedback from people in other countries who wanted to join, but because of the um, time difference, the late afternoon and early evening ones didn't work well for people in Europe. So I'm really excited to see that you're joining us from the Netherlands. Welcome. Mm -hmm. Montreal. Hello. All right. Okay, I think we're we're probably getting close to uh, the number of people that we are expecting. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started. We'll still have a couple more minutes of like intro stuff before we actually get to some techniques. So just a little more time for people to join if they need to. All right. Um, Welcome. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming to our Zoom and knit for our lightweight raglan pullover knit along. Um, if I could have my moderators and co-hosts uh, also uh, spotlight themselves so everybody can see us. Um, my name is Juliana. Uh, I'm the social media and outreach coordinator at Pearl Soho. I'm joined today by my co-host, Jaja, who's our customer service manager. Uh, and then we also have Gianna, Lily, Carly, and Margaret from our customer service team here to moderate the chat and answer your questions. Yeah, um, and so we're really excited to see everyone. Um, this is the third meeting now, we've had three. Um, the first one, we weren't ready in time to record that and put it online, but we were able to record the last one, which is up on our YouTube channel now. So if you haven't been able to see that yet, you can find it on YouTube. Um, we're not sure when this one will be posted, but if you're not already, if you subscribe, you can see an alert when the next video goes up. And so we've covered a lot of things so far. <laughs> We've pretty much finished the sleeve last time, and now we're finally gonna get started on the body. Um, but just before we get to that, I did wanna mention that we have some time slots, um, time stamps rather, um, for the video. Just if you haven't seen it already, I'm just gonna put a quick link in the chat. And we also have some time stamps to talk about when we talked, discussed and showed the following, just so you don't have to watch the whole video if you wanna recap on two at a time magic loop, the um, 
cording stitch with and without a lifeline. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and post that as well. Yeah, if you need to catch up on anything with the last YouTube video is great. It's got a lot of views, a lot of helpful information in there. And it's always nice when it's recorded and you can like pause and slow down instead of just me like barreling through a technique. You can <laughs> uh, watch it again at your own your own pace. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so uh, after we, you know, our last meeting, we really took a deep dive into the sleeves. So the next step after you finish the sleeves of the sweater is the body. So that's what we're going to be really focusing on today. Um, I'm honestly shocked that I feel like I'm on time with how I thought the knit along would go and that I have finished my sleeves and I'm on the body. Here are my, my two sleeves. They're done. I can't believe it. Uh, so we're going to be really focusing in on that today. Yeah. And if you're not that far, that's totally fine. Like I showed earlier, my, you may remember if you were here the first or second time that I had stripes going on, but I just wasn't digging my stripes. So I decided to finally undo and just restart. And it's totally fine if you're on your first sleeve, second sleeve, haven't cast it on yet. We'll still be trucking through over the next few months. Absolutely. We're still getting messages from people who are picking out their colors. Mm -hmm. totally fine. We have so much time. There is no rush. If you have finished your sweater or if you're ahead of us, that's also incredible. Like every step of the knit along <laughs> is amazing. <laughs> so yeah. So um, I sorry, just real today. quick. I saw something that said I restarted mine six times. Oh, to yeah. yeah. Sometimes that's normal. You have to. I, yeah. I have a friend who says she has to restart every project three times. Like by the time <laughs> she gets to the fourth time, she knows what she's doing. It goes fine. So totally normal and fine. <laughs> um, so we're going to go through everything for the body. We're going to start with casting on and we're going to go all the way up to joining the finished body to your sleeves, which I see somebody already asked about. So we will be talking about that as well towards the end of the call. Uh, and the big thing is we're finally going to talk about short rows. <laughs> which I have my little jazz hands going on because we've been getting questions about short rows from the very beginning since we kicked off the knit along, even though you don't actually start them until the body. So I thought that was really interesting, but just some people started their body first. Some people just, I know that's the hold up when you're first starting a sweater. Um, we're going to do wraps and turns. We'll talk about German short rows and we'll talk about the <laughs> much as how to substitute the wraps and turns for German short rows. Yes. Yeah, um, I think short rows, uh, I don't want to say they get a bad rap, but I think they sound kind of intimidating to a lot of people. They're really not that bad once you do them. Um, we'll make sure you feel really comfortable. We'll, we'll make them, we'll totally demystify short rows. Um, and once we get all through that, finally, the um, end, we have a Q&A. Uh, we will get through as many questions as we can, um, or as many as we have time for. And then finally, we would love to see your progress. Uh, so there will be an opportunity to raise your hand and join us on screen and talk about where you're at with your sweater. Um, just a reminder, I know we mentioned this at the beginning, but uh, please keep in mind that we are recording a Zoom in it to make it available later for people who couldn't make it. Um, if you don't wish to be recorded, you can always turn off your camera and mic and still follow along that way. So let's get started. I'm going to uh, switch to my other camera real quick. Um, okay, and if you guys could remove your spotlights, please, that would be awesome. Um, so the first thing we're gonna be starting with is casting on. Uh, we recommend a long tail cast on for this sweater and for most of our projects. Uh, honestly, most of our Pearl Soho projects start with the long tail cast on. Um, so we're going to put a link to our tutorial in um, the chat uh, so that you can watch the tutorial later. Um, the biggest question we always get, I would say, about long tail cast ons is how do you estimate that long tail? It can be tricky. Um, my personal favorite way is to uh, cast on about 10 stitches. And I just sort of guess with my tail for those 10 stitches. Let me see if I can get this camera a little higher so you can see my hands a little better. So I just sort of guess. I just pull out a tail of yarn and I start casting on and I cast on 10 or 15 or 20 stitches, whatever I have a tail for. Let's see, I've got five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10. Sorry, that 
needles banging on my desk. And then once I've got those 10 stitches, I'm gonna take them off the needle. But when I do, I'm gonna hold onto my tail directly under that first stitch. And as I slide it off, I'm also gonna grab that last stitch, which is really the first one that I cast on and then unravel it. This is now exactly the length of yarn needed to cast on 10 stitches. So I can use this to measure out everything I need for the rest of my sweater, 10, 20, 30, 40 and so on until I get to the amount that I need for whatever I'm casting on. And then I'll usually add because running out's the worst. So I add like four to six inches at the end before I start casting on again. Um, so that is kind of my go to. It's still not um, the best. Well, I do want to mention uh, Jaja taught me something new that I wasn't aware of. Um, Jaja, do you want to talk about your formula that you use to figure out how long to make your tail? Sure. So it's something <laughs> I found online. I did not come up with this myself, well, yeah. <laughs> but I'm, I definitely run into yarn chicken all the time, both on my cast on and <laughs> when I'm binding off. And so I looked up a way of just how to avoid that just because the 3.5 times and the, all of that wasn't really helping me. So I'm actually going to put it in the chat, the formula. That's really cool just because at the top of my head, I don't really remember it right away. Um, but it's really great if you have the number of stitches you're supposed to cast on, you multiply it by the millimeter of needles that you're gonna be using, divide by eight equals blah, 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 blah in inches. <laughs> and then you wanna add four, they add four. I tend to do six to eight for the extra tail you want at the end. Um, and then you can figure out how much you should pull in inches. And I've used this a number of times, and this has been a really great way as well to just make sure I don't have to redo my cast on, especially for a body when it's 300 stitches and you run out at 299 and it's just, no one wants to do that. Yeah, I thought that was super fascinating. I have not started a new project since two days ago when Jaja told me about this, but I'm going to try it next time I start a new project. I'm very excited. Um, but in addition to those, uh, my all time favorite way when it's this many stitches, I think for my size, it was 336 stitches or something. It's a lot of stitches and any of these methods casting on that many stitches is such a bummer if you run out. So what I did for my sweater and what I do for any time I'm casting on uh, a really, really high number of stitches is I cast on using two balls of yarn at once. I'm using two different yarns here just for the demonstration. Um, when I'm doing this for an actual project, of course, I use two of the same yarn. Um, in this case, for this sweater, I had, you know, I knit my sleeves at the same time. So I had two balls of yarn left over for my sleeves. You could also use the inside and outside of a center pole ball um, if you don't have multiple balls of yarn for your project. And so all you do is you just hold them together and make your slip knot, you know, six to eight inches from the ends of your tails while holding both yarns together. Slip that onto your needle. And now you can set up for long tail cast on using the ball or uh, the yarn coming from one ball of yarn on your thumb and the yarn coming from the other ball of yarn on your index finger and go ahead and cast on. Um, this way you don't have to estimate at all. There's absolutely no way you can run out of yarn for that long tail because it's attached to a whole ball of yarn. Um, the things to keep in mind are this, uh, this slip knot here with both yarns attached doesn't count as a stitch. So once you finish casting on however many stitches it is, I'm just gonna cast on a couple more just for demonstration. Um, I mean, theoretically, if you got a lot of stitches, this will already be at the other end of your circular needle. And you're just going to slip that double slip knot off of your needle and unravel it. Your, your last stitch won't go anywhere. You don't have to worry about that. Um, but then you can just make sure you don't count that when you're counting your stitches that you're casting on. And once you finish casting on all of your stitches, you'll just pick a tail and cut it off. Um, I mean, the, the biggest drawback I would say is you do end up with ex two extra tails of yarn to weave in. Um, and that doesn't bother me too much because I would rather weave in two, um, two tails of yarn than run out of yarn for such a long cast on or have to start over when I'm doing such a long cast on. Um, but otherwise, like, I mean, that's really the only drawback is the extra weaving in, um, which you would have a tail to weave in anyways, even if you just did a regular long tail cast on. 
Oh, there's a good um, question that somebody I asked. That I don't usually use a slip knot. I also do not usually use a slip knot. I don't know if anybody caught that when I was demonstrating the first time. I don't use a slip knot. You do have to use a slip knot when you're doing the two balls of yarn because you have to stick them together somehow to get them on the needle. But the slip knot is not permanent, as I showed. You're just going to, when you're done casting on, just slip the slip knot off the other end of the needle and unravel it. So you don't have to worry about if you avoid slip knots because you don't like that little knot feeling at the edge of your cast on, you still won't have that in the long run, but you do have to do a slip knot to get the yarn attached to the needle somehow in order to begin casting on. So cool. All right. Yeah. And just to reiterate, um, I, cause I know you're using two balls of yarn colors, but that's just because you have two different ones. But if you yeah. are doing this, I assume you would use the same color. Exactly. Yes. Um, this is what I did for the body of my sweater. And I just used two balls of the same color of the same yarn and went ahead and cast on. Um, so, but yeah, the two were just for demonstration. So you could see that I was using two balls of yarn as I was casting on. All right, um, so once you get all those stitches cast on, I saw somebody mentioned that they had to start over several times because their cast on was twisted. Uh, it's it's a bummer. <laughs> it is something that, uh, you know, if you don't catch it soon enough is not fixable. Um, so in order to avoid twisting your cast on, um, one of uh, the things I always try to do is sort of match my needle length to the size of what I'm casting on. Um, so for instance, um, my sweater, uh, basically, so the reason is, you know, if you have a very, a, a needle much shorter than your cast on, you know, how it gets real sort of squished up and twisty, that can make it really hard to spot a twist. So whenever possible, I try to just pick a needle length similar to what I'm casting on. Um, I'm doing the size 44 of this sweater. So I used a 40 inch long uh, needle for my cast on. Um, so that way your stitches are not too spread out, but also not too crunched up. Um, so if you were doing a smaller size, you would do a 32 inch um, for a larger size. Like if you were doing like one of the size 50 or so, maybe you would want to use a 47 inch needle if you have it. Um, just makes it a little easier to spot. Um, the other thing that really, really helps, which I always do is I knit one row before I join in the round. And I have done that here. It makes a slight jog a little bit more of a jog than usual. Um, however, no matter what, you're always gonna have to weave in your tail from casting on. Um, so again, like it's sort of a trade-off of there. Yes, there's a little bit of a jog, but you have to weave in this tail anyway. So just when I weave in that tail, I kind of pull it over to close up that jog. Um, and once you, by doing this, so, you know, if you've just cast it on, it's a very small ridge that you're keeping an eye on trying to spot that twist. If you knit one row, you now have a much more stable, larger ridge that you're looking at. So if there is a twist, which this is twisted, I twisted this on purpose, um, you can usually spot it a lot easier or at least feel it. Um, so if you've done all that and you still twist your cast on as long as you don't get too far you can fix it um so i twisted this on purpose when i'm uh when i'm casting on like when i did this sweater i checked kind of compulsively <laughs> you know i joined it in the round uh after i would say probably halfway through and three quarters of the way through the first round i was checking for twists when you get to the end of the first round, you always want to double check and make sure you haven't twisted because it can be fixed at this point. So this um, has a twist. You can kind of see right here if you follow this, uh, what I've done so far. And I also did knit one row before joining in the round. But if you follow it, you can see that this cast on edge twists around to here. But since this is just the first row or first round after joining in the round, if I get over to the beginning of the round, I didn't put a marker in, but this is the beginning of the round. You can see that there's only one strand of yarn holding this together at this point. So at this point, you can untwist by just taking that edge, untwisting it as much as you need to. And when you get back to the uh, edge of the left hand needle, just kind of dip your left hand needle underneath and around. And now I'm untwisted and ready to keep knitting. You can do this definitely when you've only knit one round, 
you can kind of do it when you've only knit two rounds. If you've knit two rounds, if you imagine there will be two bars of yarn there that you'll be kind of twisting together, but it's not too obvious. If you get past the second round, this does not work as well. So I really recommend just taking a look at your knitting frequently during that first round, during that second round to make sure there isn't a twist that you haven't missed it so that you can untwist it before it before it's too late because if you get past that point um as we all know you have to start over there is no way to fix a twist in your knitting um once you're past that first or second round so um i hope that helps because that is really um such a it's heartbreaking when you have to start over because you've twisted your knitting um it's always so sad like when we meet a beginner knitter who's twisted their knitting and they're like oh how do i fix it and the answer is you can't it's it's a bummer so i hope that helps some of you we don't have a video showing that untwisting um and i i don't even know if there's a name for that technique uh i can show you again i'll just put the twist back in because it's essentially the same thing um so let's see so here's my twisted cast on and i'm right at the beginning of the round after knitting joining the round and knitting one round and i'm just going to follow this around untwisting as i go so that this cast on edge is all facing the same direction and when i get up to the tip of the left hand needle i'm just going to dip that left hand needle under the knitting and around so that it untwists and you may just have to play with it the direction my twist was going i had to bring the needle under sometimes if your twist is going the other direction you may have to bring your needle over and to the back um so just you know if you find that you've twisted your work and you have to do this you may just kind of have to play with that and just double check a couple times to make sure it is actually untwisted before you keep knitting all right i hope that's hope that's helpful um now the next step of the body is the cording stitch we're not actually going to demo the the cording stitch today because we have done it in the last couple of zoom meetings and we have a tutorial available on our website. Um, we're going to uh, put a link to the cording stitch tutorial in the chat for you, as well as a link to the YouTube video from last time where we demonstrated it if you do want to watch it. Um, I am going to answer. Somebody said I knit continental. Am I correct that the corded stitch is more of a pain because the loose yarn has to move, be moved from the back to pick up the stitch in the back? You are not wrong. Jaja is also a continental knitter and she agrees with you. It is more challenging continental. Um, and also just if you imagine, you know, your working yarn, if you're knitting continental, is essentially like in front of the stitch you have to pick up in the back. Um, so yeah, it's a little bit more uh, work if it's continental. We really recommend trying the um, lifeline uh, method, which is in our tutorial and in the video from last time. Because um, even if you're knitting continental, that lifeline should really help. Uh, one thing I thought was uh, interesting, I don't want to get into this too much because we have talked about the cording stitch so much in the past. Um, one of my friends who I'm knitting with in person, instead of a lifeline, what she's doing for the cording stitch is she's flipping it around to the back, then she's using an extra needle, she's just using a double pointed needle, and she's picking up 10 bumps at a time, then she flips it around to the front and knits them together with the stitches on the needle. And then she flips it around to the back, picks up 10 more, flips it around to the front and knits it together with the stitches on the needle. Um, so if you're knitting continental and you're still um, struggling with it, struggling with the cording stitch, that might be another method to try. Yeah, I see somebody else said uh, the continental knitter found it harder on the sleeve, but wasn't as difficult on the body. Um, I think that might be the case for any knitter because when it's on the sleeve and you're on the double pointed needles or the magic loop, there's just a lot less room to work. It's a little easier on the body because you have so much more space in the back of your work. All right. Okay, so we've we've talked about casting on, starting the body, you're going to do your cording stitch. The very next step is the short rows, which are not as scary as you think. Um, one thing I'm going to point out, because we've had this question a couple times, um, hopefully, let me see if I can angle my light a little better so you can see these stitches in more detail oops 
That would help if I left it on. Um, we've had a lot of questions about wrap and turns versus uh, German short rows. One of the questions that specifically came up last time was your German short row tutorial says they're so great that you're never going to want to use wrap and turns again. So why does the pattern call for wrap and turns? Um, so I just wanted to point out on this swatch, I did a little bit of experimenting. Um, on this side of my work, these are German short rows. On this side of my work are wrap and turns. And I noticed when I did them side by side, you can see the German short rows a little bit. See, there's a German short row there. There's a German short row there. The stitch just looks a little uh, maybe twisted or a larger, slightly distorted compared to the rest. The wrap and turn side, I cannot see them at all. Um, so this may be something to keep in mind. Now I am doing German short rows on my own sweater and I feel like in, you know, after blocking differences like this are going to be far less obvious anyways. Um, but I did find it interesting that the short, the wrap and turns actually look kind of nicer than the German short rows. Um, so just something to keep in mind if you're making up, if you're trying to decide which method to use. Um, another thing I left on here, uh, we've gotten a lot of emails from people saying, I'm doing my short rows and I'm getting holes in my work. Um, and almost always the reason is that they're not picking up the wraps from their short rows, from their wrap and turn short rows. So right here where I've got these bars going across my work, this is where I've done the wrap and turn, but then on the following row, I did not pick up the wrap. I just purled right past it. Um, and as you can see, it leaves a bar on the right side of your work. And it's not super obvious at this gauge or maybe just because of the, the how I'm holding it, but it does leave a small hole next to it. Um, so that if you're doing your short rows and you're finding that you're getting holes next to them, it may just be that you're not picking up the wraps correctly. Um, so uh, let's talk about wrap and turn short rows. Um, if we haven't already, oh, let's, uh, if a moderator could put the link to our wrap and turn short row tutorial in the chat, that would be awesome. Um, so I'm just gonna do a couple wrap and turn short rows just to show how to work them and how to pick them up. I'm um, just gonna get past the halfway point real quick here. Um, and one of the trickiest part with, uh, wrap and turn short rows is keeping track of where they are. Uh, when you're in the middle of a row, and so this pattern uh, will say like, you know, you work your wrap and turn, and then you purl a certain number of stitches, you work another wrap and turn. Uh, starting with short row three, you will knit to the wrap stitch, pick up or knit the stitch together with its wrap, knit three more stitches and work another wrap and turn. It can be really hard to spot those wrapped stitches when you're trying to knit or purl back to them, especially on the purl side. So let me just go ahead and work a wrap and turn. So I'm gonna work a wrap and turn by moving my yarn to the front, slipping the next stitch, moving my yarn to the back. So this is the wrap where my yarn has now wrapped around that stitch and slipping the stitch back over to the left-hand needle. Now to keep track of these, as I said, they're difficult to um, spot. It's really helpful to just pop a removable stitch marker into the actual wrap stitch before you do anything else. You can also put it on the wrap. I kind of like putting it in the stitch better. And so this is just hanging out on that stitch. And now I'm gonna just turn and purl a couple stitches and do another wrap and turn. And on the wrong side, I leave my yarn in the front, slip the stitch purl wise, wrap my yarn to the back of the work, slip the stitch back over to the left hand needle and bring it to the front just because the next stitch is knitting. And again, same thing on the purl side, just grab another removable marker, slip it into that wrap stitch and leave it there. Now this is a very small swatch. When you're doing your actual sweater, I wanna say for my size, I have to like knit 50 something or 60 something stitches to get over to that wrap stitch. And they can be hard to spot. If you haven't used a marker, what you have to look for is this gap here, which again, if you've got a lot of stitches and they're kind of squished up on the needle, that gap tends to disappear. But that marker is really helpful. So now when your instructions say to, knit to the wrap stitch and knit it together with its wrap, there's no question about which stitch is the wrap stitch because you have this marker just hanging out in the stitch to help you find it. Um, 
You can actually leave it in if you want to move it to the back, um, or you can take it out when you get to each one for this pattern. Um, other patterns where you have multiple um, wrapped stitches in your work at the same time, it's even more helpful to leave those markers in so you know where they all are. Um, this particular pattern, you're only going to have two wrapped stitches in your work at any one time. Um, right, I just saw somebody said in the chat they used a marker because they can't imagine with the smaller yarn finding that wrap stitch. You're absolutely right. Um, this is linen quill worsted that I'm using for my sample, which has some texture. Regular linen quill has even more texture, which makes it even harder to spot that little wrap and that little gap between the stitches. So if you have them handy and you're having trouble spotting your wrap stitches, just go ahead and use a marker. All right, and so then when you're knitting the wrap with the stitch, uh, and I'm sorry if this was not the best yarn I chose for this sample, but here's this little horizontal bar, bar of yarn that's wrapped around the stitch on the needle. So I'm going to put my right hand needle into that bar of yarn and then into the stitch that's on the needle and knit them together. And it can be a little tricky, sorry that stitch marker's in the way, to pull it through to the front to make sure you also get through the wrap and the stitch at the same time. And then it just kind of disappears. Now in our pattern, it then says to knit, uh, depending on your size, I'm gonna go with two, two more stitches and then work another wrap and turn. And so same thing, you're gonna just wrap that stitch, pop another stitch marker into the wrapped stitch so you can find it later. and purl over. Um, I'm not gonna do this a ton more because I know we wanna get to German short rows, um, but if you look, so this is that wrapped stitch on the wrong side. You can see the markers sort of hanging out in the front, so it's hard to see the marker, but you can kind of see that wrap looks just like a purl bump on the wrong side. So they're even harder to find on the wrong side. So if you're struggling, use the markers. Markers are very helpful. I love markers. All right. And then to pick up that pearlwise wrap and turn, same thing, I'm gonna knit over to the stitch with the marker. Now to grab the wrap is a little trickier from the pearl side because the wrap is here in the, what's relative to you as you're holding it, the back of the work. So you're gonna go into that wrap uh, pearlwise from the back of the work, then into the stitch pearlwise, and knit them together. And if you wanna see that slower in more detail, our wrap and turn short row tutorial will really be helpful. Um, I mainly wanted to show you guys the trick with the markers for keeping track of them because I don't think that's in our tutorial. All right, so um, next we're gonna talk about German short rows and I'm just gonna finish this row so that we're past these and don't have to look at them. So uh, German short rows are, I would say most people consider German short rows easier to work than a uh, wrap and turn. They're definitely easier to spot uh, on the needle. And I'll show you that in a second. Let me knit over and do a German short row. So when you're substituting German short rows for wrap and turns, really all you have to do is add one extra stitch. So for instance, um, the short row one for my size on the body says knit 103 and then work a wrap and turn. When I'm substituting German short rows, I will knit 104 um, and then work a double stitch. So to work a double stitch, let's say I've just knit my 103 stitches over here that's called for in the pattern. I'm going to knit one extra stitch then you turn to the other, you turn first, slip that stitch with the yarn in front, and then tug your working yarn over the top of the right hand needle. And what this does, it creates what's called a double stitch. If you can kind of see, it makes like a little lumpy thing. In this case, because my next stitch is a purl, I'm also going to bring it around to the front and purl. But let me show you what that double stitch looks like. Um, the double stitch is much easier to spot than a wrapped stitch. Um, it has this sort of lump on the top of the needle and you can see that there are like two strands of yarn involved. 
Um, and same thing on the purl side, you're going to purl however many the pattern calls for, then purl one extra. Turn your work, bring your yarn to the front. When you're turning to the right side, you do have to bring your yarn to the front. Slip that stitch with the yarn in front and then tug your working yarn over the top of the right hand needle into the back before knitting the following stitch. And again, you can see it's just much easier to spot. It's a little easier to work, I think, um, compared to a wrap and turn. Um, and again, our German short row tutorial shows this uh, much slower in more detail and multiple times. It does also go over how to substitute German short rows um, for uh, wrap and turns. Now, when you come back to them, I'm just gonna knit over, much easier to spot. All you do is you knit it together as if almost like you're, it feels kind of like you're doing a knit two together to resolve that double stitch. Now I found when I was doing my own sweater, um, you have to keep track of where you are in the short rows, right? And I did not print out my pattern and I thought I'll be fine. I don't have to print out my pattern. And I completely lost track of where I was. And German short rows, even though, you know, in my sample down here, they're a little easier to spot in the actual linen quill sweater they're almost impossible to spot in your work. Um, so I found it helpful again. So with the German short rows, I don't have to use the markers to indicate where the short row is in terms of my knitting, but to keep track of how many I've done, I found it very helpful every time I resolved a double stitch to just pop a removable marker into that stitch. So this is right where I've just done a double stitch. Um, I'll show you what that looks like on my actual sweater. I kind of have a hodgepodge of markers in here. Um, I only did them on one side of my work. So then when I'm counting them, this is short row one, this is short row three, this is short row five, short row seven, and so on. So if you are not keeping track of them on paper, I would say the best way is to keep track on paper. It can also be helpful to just use your markers to indicate where you've done your short rows in case you, you know, forget to mark one down, you lose your place. Um, I found this really uh, got me back on track and kept me from losing my place again. Um, somebody said, what if you didn't do the extra stitch on the purl side? I did that once. I forgot to do the extra stitch on the purl side. With this pattern, if you know you've forgotten to do one of these stitches, you can just kind of make it up in the following row and nobody will know. So I did forget to um, purl an extra stitch uh, one time. And on the following row, I just uh, purled two extra to make up for it. If you've done it consistently, if you are, you know, most of the way through or halfway through your short rows and you've consistently always forgotten to do the extra stitch on the purl side, um, you may want to go back um, because uh, when you're doing these short rows. So here's my uh, beginning of the round marker here. Um, I also found it helpful to place a marker at the halfway point. This is not in our pattern, but I found this helpful just to indicate that between these two markers is basically the front of your sweater. This would be like a sort of fake side seam, I guess, if we were doing something over there. Um, and when you do this short rows, short rows one through 28 are the first side. Short row 27 should be either a wrap and turn or German short row in the last stitch of the front. So right next to this marker. And then short row 28 should be in the first stitch. You can see I've still got my uh, German short row right there. Um, so if you do everything correct with this set of short rows, you will be ending in the first and last stitches of your front. Now, so if you've consistently forgotten to do that extra stitch, you may not be getting all the way back over to the front and your um, curved hem may be slightly off center. So if you've gotten pretty far and you've always done that, you may wanna go back and start over on the short rows just to get everything back on track. Um, I also found this second marker helpful when you're ready to transition to starting the short rows on the second half or the back of the sweater. Um, so our, our pattern says, you know, you work your final short row 28, you do your um, wrap and turn or German short row here, and then it says knit, I don't know the numbers, but what happens when you knit short row 29 is you go all the way through the front of your sweater, 
And then you end up at the same point you did for short row one. So my short row one started at 103 stitches into the front. The short row 29 for the back of the sweater should start 103 stitches into the back of the sweater. Um, so I just also found this helpful as just a little um, double check to make sure that I'm set up correctly for the second set of short rows to make sure the back curve will also be centered on the back of the sweater. So hopefully that is also helpful. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry if you have to start over on your short rows, but I think it will be better in the long run if it's nice and centered. All right, so any any other last questions about the short rows, either wrap and turns or German short rows or the placement of the short rows? No, all right. Are we willing, you know what, let's talk about striping in the Q&A at the section at the end, because I have a couple more things I want to go over, um, but definitely save that question. We can, we can totally talk about stripes. Zsa, Zsa has lots to say about stripes, I'm sure. <laughs> okay, um, so that is the short rows. Um, another thing I wanted to cover, um, for many of us, you probably did not have to join a ball of yarn when you were doing your sleeves. If you were using like linen quill or cattail silk, uh, they have enough yardage to get through a, a sleeve. Um, but now that we're on the body of the sweater, you're almost definitely going to have to join a ball of yarn at some point. Um, so I did want to talk about that. We do have a tutorial, which a member of our moderator team is going to put in chat. Um, our official sort of recommended method for joining a new ball of yarn is to simply start knitting with the new one. Um, if you're knitting flat, you may have heard the uh, advice in the before to always do it at the beginning of a round. Um, similar with this sweater, if you're, um, since it's in the round, you're not actually at the edge of your work, but if you can join your yarn um, close to one of the sort of side seams, that's just going to be a less obvious spot for weaving in your ends. Um, but if you're comfortable with weaving in ends, you can kind of join anywhere. It doesn't matter a ton. Um, all you're going to do to join a new ball of yarn, or one option, is to simply start knitting with the new yarn. Oh, let me grab my white yarn, sorry. Um, which means you're going to knit to the point where you only have like five or six inches of yarn left. Put your needle into the next stitch, grab your new ball of yarn, and I just sort of fold it in half. I haven't done anything real special here. I've just sort of folded it in half so that I can loop it over in the middle of the stitch and start knitting with it. And then you just leave your short tail and keep knitting with your long tail. Um, this is a perfectly fine method of adding a new ball of yarn. It does leave a hole in your work. Sometimes we'll have people uh, do this and they panic because they go come back to it and there's a big hole in their work and it feels loose and that's totally normal. Um, when you weave in these ends in the back, when you get to the end of the sweater, all you do is you sort of cross them over each other to close up that hole and then weave them in. Um, we're not gonna get into a ton of detail about weaving in ends. We're sort of save that for a later meeting when we're all closer to the finishing steps of our sweater. Um, but this works perfectly fine. This is in our tutorial, which uh, Gianna put in the chat for you. Um, just so you have another option, uh, my personal favorite way to join a ball of yarn is to do one stitch with the old strand and new strand held together. So same thing, you're going to knit till you have, you know, five or six inches left of your ball of yarn. Then you're going to take your new ball of yarn, which will, in your actual uh, knitting experience, be the same color. I'm just using two different colors for demonstration. Hold them together as if they're one and do one stitch with both strands held together. Then you drop your old ball of yarn and keep going with your new ball of yarn. Um, I like this method because you don't have that hole. You do have to remember on the following row when you're purling back to knit this together as one stitch so that you're not accidentally doing um, an extra, making an extra stitch every time you do it. Um, Somebody asked about the uh, spit splice tutorial. Gianna did put a uh, link to it in there. 
it will not, it probably won't work with linen quill. Uh, it definitely won't work with cattail silk. Um, if you're not familiar with it, a spit splice, we call it a wet splice because we don't want spits gross, you know. <laughs> so we call it a wet splice. Basically, um, you felt the two ends of the yarn together. Um, you get them wet with a little bit of water and you kind of like fluff out the end of the yarn and then you roll them in your hand to felt it together. Um, it does not work really well for thin yarns in my experience. It works best. Um, it has to be wool or another animal fiber that will felt. Uh, so it will not work at all with cattail silk. Um, and it tends to work best with sort of single ply fluffy wools. They felt very, very easily. Um, linen quill, because it has the 15% linen content, because it's so thin, I don't, it, it, I would not probably try a wet splice with that. If you're using something like, uh, if you're familiar with Brooklyn Tweed Loft, that is a thin yarn that will spit splice pretty well. Um, but it's still, it can make sort of a thick area in your knitting. Um, I have one sweater where I, I did the wet splices and I was so happy I didn't have to weave in tails. And then it turned out one of the spots where I did that was sort of on the front of a shawl collar and you can actually see it because you are felting together two, you know, two lengths or two thicknesses of yarn. So it made a slightly thicker spot in my sweater, which was kind of a bummer. Um, so, you know, just keep that in mind. This, you have a lot more control over what things look like from the right side of your sweater by, you know, either just dropping the yarn and knitting with the new one or doing one stitch with two held together and weaving in your ends. I saw somebody said they do four or five stitches together. It's not wrong, but again, you can run into that same problem I had with my spit splice where you have a thicker area. When it's just one stitch that's two strands held together, um, you're not gonna see it in the right side of your work. Some yarns, you could do four or five and you won't see it from the right side of your work anyway. Um, but there's always the risk that you're going to end up with like, you know, four or five stitches that are thicker and heavier, and it might be kind of obvious. Um, so there are so many different methods of joining yarn. These are sort of our two favorite or two recommended methods. If you have one that you love, I know there's, uh, there's all sorts of other, other methods like Russian joins or magic knots. I don't trust them myself, but if you are familiar with them and you love them, you can go ahead and use them. But I just wanted to cover those in case, because um, I know we've got a lot of people knitting their very first sweater, um, sort of beginner knitters, so I want to make sure you're prepared for when you run out of your first ball of yarn. Okay, um, placing the underarm stitches on hold. So back to the, you're going to get your hem done, you're going to do your short rows. Oh, I accidentally skipped over adjusting the length of the body of the sweater. Um, so we did have, I saw one question come in where somebody was asking, where do you measure from? Um, and it's a little easy to miss in the pattern, but the pattern does say that you're going to be measuring from the longest point of the body. So when you're looking at your curved hem, um, I believe it's about three and a half inches here at the sort of center front or center back. And that's where you're going to measure from when you're measuring the full length of your body. You're not going to measure from this side seam here where it's super short. Um, of course, you can always adjust that. Uh, I made my sleeves two inches longer. I bet I'm going to be making my body at least two inches longer. Um, so just kind of keep in mind, although you're measuring from that front, um, you know, curved hem, uh, for myself, I will also be measuring the side just to make sure the side of my sweater, uh, makes it past the top of my pants, if that makes sense, because the front of your sweater may make it past the top of your pants, but that side seam, because it curves up, you want to make sure, depending on how you like to wear your sweaters, I want to make sure the side seam of mine makes it past the top of my pants. Um, and fortunately, this sweater's uh, straight up and down. There is no shaping in the body. So you can go ahead and lengthen it or shorten it as you wish. There's no, um, not really anything to it other than making sure if you're going to be lengthening it by a lot, um, you may need some extra yarn. So just keep that in mind if you think that's something you might do. So placing the underarm stitches on hold. 
Um, and I'm just going to use this swatch to demonstrate. We talked about this last time as well, but it is, again, sort of a tricky spot we get a lot of questions about. Um, I'm going to uh, pop this stitcher, stitch marker in here to just sort of simulate my beginning of the round. Um, so when you get to the top of your sweater, it's the length or the body of your sweater, it's the length you want it to be, you have to place your underarm stitches on hold. And what our pattern says to do is to knit a certain number of stitches, I believe for the smallest size, you knit five stitches. Four, uh, five. And then you place the previous 10 stitches on hold. That is going to cross over your beginning of the round marker. So when you place those stitches on hold, they will be centered over the beginning of the round marker. I did not get out a, um, a, a stitch holder for demonstrating this, but I will show you on my actual sleeves. Um, and it's the same on the body of the sweater. On the sleeves, you have this, this is my line right here from my increases on the sleeves. And you can see that my held stitches are centered directly over that line of increases. When you do this on the body, the held stitches should be centered directly over that side seam. If you have placed the second marker to show the other side seam, um, that can also help you make sure you get the second set of underarm stitches placed in the correct spot because it can be tricky. Um, so after you place, you know, the first set on hold, then you go back to knitting the rest of your stitches and you'll have to knit all the way around the body to the other side seam to place the other set of underarm stitches on hold. Um, somebody asked about shortening the sleeves. We'll talk about that in the Q&A because it's not quite as easy as you would think, unfortunately. Uh, shortening the body, very easy. Shortening the sleeves, not quite so easy. Um, and then finally, once you do that, the last step is joining the sleeves to the body. We're going to put a link in the chat. We have a whole video tutorial that will show you every step of joining the sleeves to the body. It's super useful. Um, but, uh, we, I don't have a swatch ready for that today. I will have a swatch ready for that next time. Essentially, you're just going to knit across the sleeve then knit across the front of the sweater, knit across the second sleeve and knit across the back of the sweater. So they all end up on one needle. Um, and you'll see that in our tutorial. It's really detailed. It's really helpful um, because this is again, another step we get a lot of questions about. So we went ahead and made a whole tutorial that will answer all your questions about that. So um, we are just, to, that's everything I had planned to talk about today. Um, I think I'm going to switch over to my regular video. Um, Jaja, do you have any questions from the Q&A that we can cover? Um, sorry, I'm just unmuting. <laughs> um, and then put myself back on. Thanks for highlighting me, whoever did that. Mm -hmm. um, so it was interesting. I feel like we got less questions this time because I think people were focused on the demonstration since we had a lot more than we did the previous time. Uh, but we still have a few in there that I wanted to um, go over. So let's kind of go by section. Um, so this one's talking about the yarn. Um, Cindy asked, am I correct in assuming there's no need for alternating skeins if you're using the Pearl Soho? I assume she's talking about linen quilt, but just variegated yarns. Uh, yeah, if you're yeah. using linen quilt or cattail silk, I would not alternate skeins unless you happen to have two different dye lots. That's the only situation mm -hmm. where I would. Um, yeah, I, that's usually more of a concern for hand dyed yarn. Um, if you were substituting Posy, that is a yarn that we recommend alternating skeins for. Mm -hmm. um, or if you're using your own yarn, if you've gone with like an indie dyer or something and done something real speckled, real variegated, which I know there are a couple, at least a couple of people out there doing that, then yes, you probably will want to alternate skeins, but not with just, you know, linen quill, cattail silk. Uh, those are usually called, uh, not industrially dyed. I forget what the word for it is, but when it's commercially dyed, that's yeah. right. Yeah. So when something's commercially dyed, you almost never have to, um, alternate skeins. So you should be fine. Mm -hmm. So, um, on some other ones, we have fit questions. Um, the, what about shortening sleeves? So we can get into yeah, that if it's so too we'll, difficult. 
Yeah, we can talk about that a little bit. So yes, it's possible to shorten your sleeves, but you have to plan ahead for it um, because you start with the bottom of the sleeve. And so that is now a fixed um, uh, diameter. Um, if you were to have your sleeves up here, let me see if I can try on one of my sleeves, I'll have to pull my other sweater out of the way. So for instance, here's my finished sleeve. And you know, at my wrist, it's a nice comfortable fit. If I were to pull it up to like three quarter, I really can't go any further than three quarter. It starts getting really tight. So you're, if you're going to shorten your sleeves, you want to sort of measure your arm where you want them to be and decide how many stitches to cast on. If you reach out to us, if you really want to do that, you can reach out to us and we can help you with the math a little bit. You basically have to measure your arm, figure out how many stitches to cast on. And then you have to remove that number of increases. So instead of increasing 20 times, if you've cast on, let's say six fewer stitches, that means you're gonna increase 17 times. Um, the key things are making sure it fits here and that you end up with the correct number of stitches at the top of the sleeve so that your raglan decreases work out well. So it's possible, it just takes some math and some planning. Um, mm -hmm. And some people, I mean, it's certainly, you know, on my arm, if I pull my sleeve up higher, it's an uncomfortable fit. Some people may not find that to be the case. Like you may measure your arm and compare it to uh, on the last page of the pattern is a schematic that has the circumference at the bottom of the sleeve. If it's gonna fit comfortably, you do have a couple inches up here you can play with. Once you finish the increases on the sleeve, most sizes have like two or three inches of knitting straight before you're done with the sleeve. Um, so as long as your cuff fits comfortably, you could take it out. You could take out the length at the top of the sleeve without making any alterations to the increases. Thank you. Um, so another one about fit. Thank you, Juliana. Um, there's one about the underarm, but I wanna get to another from Patricia before that. I just wanted to be clear on the design. The front is longer than the back, right? Since all the short rows are in front. There are two sets of short rows. The, the sweater is symmetrical in the front and back. So when you do short rows one through 28, those are all on the front, as you saw on my sweater. This is short rows one through 28. Short row 29 then has you knit all the way through to the back of the sweater, about you know three quarters of the way through the back of the sweater. And then you repeat short rows one through 28. So there is a curve on both the front and back of the sweater and it is symmetrical. Yeah. And so going back to the arm um, from Laura, from the pattern, is the fit tight or loose in the underarm? I left my sleeves adjustable depending on the body fit. It's, Schematic you know, again. it's kind of hard to say because everybody's a different length here, yeah. right? And that's <laughs> much harder. Yeah, that's much harder to account for in a raglan sweater. Like when you're doing a, um, a set in sleeve sweater, it'll usually say like knit, I don't know, eight inches before you get to the underarm shaping. And so, you down. know, you can sort of adjust it. When it's raglan, it's kind of set. If again, if you look at the schematic on the last page of the pattern, I'm just pulling it up right now. Um, it does have the length. So on the left side of the schematic, it shows that the back neck is uh, three quarter inches to one and a quarter inches higher, um, depending on your size. And then it has a measurement approximately from the shoulder straight down to the armpit. So if you can get a friend to help you measure, like kind of, you know, right at the back of your neck where the sweater, most sweaters hit, check that measurement and then sort, you'll have to sort of visually see like where on you that hits. Um, but that should give you a better idea of how much space there is in the armpit, but it is going to kind of vary depending on how tall you are, how tall that measurement is in your shoulders. All right. Thank you. Um, are you willing to go into striping? <laughs> this is the, the stripe conversation. But also, I was I saw another one about striping as well. Oh, I think this was because it was during the short rows. Um, that somebody um, asked about striping. So yes, yes, we love stripes. Yes, although uh, to be honest, I haven't gotten to the short rows yet because that's in the body. So I don't have any tips ahead of time for that quite yet, but. I know even when I was doing the increases, I wanted to be careful of only doing certain colors when I was doing a regular knit row, not an increase row, just so it didn't look funny in between. 
So for that, I do not have it right next to me. I should have, but I had some graph paper um, and I just went and I actually, with the highlighter, um, just filled in in advance to see if it was going to interrupt it. That's more so for the sleeves and the increases. Um, I'm trying to, I'll have to think about the short rows, how it would yeah, affect it, but do you? I would probably recommend not doing stripes in the actual short rows of the yeah. body. You know, have the, I, it will, I have seen people do this, yeah. so it's not um, it's not unprecedented to do the curved short rows, a solid color, and then start your stripes above that. Um, mm -hmm. It's possible. Yeah, it, I, I'm going to say it's possible, but not probably not fun. And yeah, really <laughs> stripes while you're doing those short rows. So I would. It, if you're really up for a challenge, if you're really confident with short rows, maybe give it a shot. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I would recommend doing the curved part of the short row solid and then starting your stripes above that. Yeah, I think that's why I was doing a solid block, thin stripes, and then little more stripes going gradually into a solid color again. Yeah, I'll have to um, look again. I know somebody submitted a picture of the body of their sweater with stripes through our um, knit along gallery on our website. Yeah. Um, and I'm almost positive she just left off the curved short rows. If you know who you are, you can correct me. I would have to look at it again. But was it the blue and white you know, one? Because I know I no, saw a blue was, and white one. It was gray and black. Oh, okay, I haven't seen that one yet. So I didn't even think to mention this before. You can skip the short rows. If you don't want a curved hem of your body, just skip them. Like just cast <laughs> on do your cording stitch and start knitting like there's uh absolutely no reason not to do that if you prefer to have a straight hem on your sweater that's totally fine um and i want to say that that person who submitted a picture with the stripes did that and started her their stripes yeah. right from the get <laughs> so also an option mm -hmm. would an intarsia joint work i haven't heard of this is when we we're talking about the different joints I yeah, I'm not, not familiar, familiar with, with the Intarsia joint. I'm going to look that up because I okay. love learning new things. Um, we'll save that for next time. <laughs> we will save that for next time, though. We'll make a note and we will learn about the Intarsia joint for next time. Okay. I'm not sure my short rows are perfect. Is there a way I can tell before I go too far? Was I feel like, did this get answered in the chat? Can the moderator let me know? No, not yet. Um, this is from Galilee Beach Club, who I, I think I've seen in all three meetings now. We have seen you before. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> yeah. Um, maybe so maybe send us a picture, I would say. Yeah, send know. us a picture. We'll take a look. Um, the best way to tell is, as I mentioned, the last two short rows should be in the first and last stitch of the front body. So if you've placed that um, second marker, so that you have one at the beginning of the row and one exactly, sorry, I'm gonna scoot over. I'm not centered on my camera. One exactly at the halfway point of your stitches. Then when you do that first set of short rows, you're gonna be ending in the first and last stitch of that half of your sweater. Um, and that's usually my, um, when I'm knitting, that's how I check before going on is just making sure like when I get towards the end, I'll just check like, you know, maybe the last, Oh, I don't know. When it gets easy to count, like I'll do a knit side short row and see that there are 10 stitches left before the marker. And then I'll do the corresponding purl side short row and double check that there are still 10 stitches left before the next marker. Because after you do a set of a knit and purl short row, you should have the same number of stitches left on each side of your work. Um, but that's the best way to check. You can always send us a picture and we'll take yeah. a look and if you need to, we also offer free one-on-one -on -one Zoom help sessions yes. so we can sit down and work it out with you and decide what the best course of action is. Mm -hmm. um, if someone could put a link for the one-on-one -on -one project help in the chat, that would be great. Yes, please. Um, we have a laddering question from Anna Stone. I'm using the cattail silk and knitting two sleeves at a time with magic loop. There is laddering, loose stitches at the midpoint and beginning of rounds whenever I have to change to the second needle. How can I deal with closing those areas so the joints are not visible? This is another question we've been getting a lot in the yes. emails. Um, yeah, we've laddering about it once, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> laddering is a problem. Um, you know, and some of the tricks, like when you're doing last time we talked about when you're doing double pointed needles, how you just can kind of keep rotating them through by always knitting an extra stitch or two doesn't work with magic loop really. You kind of can move that where the magic loop is, but it's not quite as easy. 
Um, and cattail silk, I can totally see having even more problems with laddering because it doesn't have the same elasticity or like fluffiness as linen quill. Um, they should improve a little bit with blocking. Often, if your laddering is mild, blocking will improve it, uh, but not always, unfortunately. Yeah. And I feel like cattail silk might be one of those yarns where yeah, blocking is not going to have as much of an effect. Um, for me, I tend to uh, to lean on the side of pulling too tight when I'm doing magic loop. Um, so when you're doing magic loop, uh, if you think about it after you've switched and you're pulling your yarn over to knit, that last stitch is actually on the cord of your needle, which should be a little bit thinner than your actual needle tip itself. Um, so I pull really tight <laughs> because you can. And then I keep that tension on for the first two stitches. Um, because if you just keep it on for the first stitch, uh, it tends to sort of loosen back up by the time you knit the second stitch. So I just keep that really tight for the first two stitches every time I switch my magic loop. Um, I will show you. I don't know if you'll be able to see. I go so tight that I get the opposite of a ladder. I get like a, a little cinch. <laughs> like I get a little cinch. Um, I do know from experience it will block out. I had that same cinch on this sweater. It's gone. You can't see it anymore. Um, so I really like those first two stitches. Keep them nice and tight. Um, and it should, if, if you find yourself going the opposite direction and getting a little fold or a little cinch, that's fine. That's a good thing, I think, because that should almost definitely block out. And something I see a lot too is that a lot of people, when they start to see ladders, start to get a little nervous and they kind of overcompensate by knitting just that first stitch really tight. Um, so that's something that you want to be careful of because what winds up happening is there's slack from the entire round of your knitting when you're working something. And so when you're just doing something really tight on that first stitch, you have a lot of extra yarn left over and that's what's creating <laughs> that ladder. So I recommend trying to not knit too, too tight on just the first stitch and keeping it more, trying to keep it consistent on both either the first two stitches or the second to last and then the first or even just the second, like something like that. It's just when you find that good groove and just take a breath before you do it and don't yes. do it extra tight. Yeah. And I see Gianna said, um, you can email us questions and share mm -hmm. images for our feedback. We'd be happy to help you, you know, see if we can take a look at your technique and tweak it to maybe help uh, get rid yeah, of those ladders. I saw somebody saying that they had a really bad time with the flexi flips and as a flexi, flexi flip defender, <laughs> I, just, <laughs> I just wanted to show you mine are not super tight, but I just wanted to show an example of what mine look like right now. Just, oh, you can see my little bees. <laughs> But uh, let's let this, it's a little bright, calm down. But mine are like this. So they're a little loose, but they're not, I'm not getting flatters right now. And so there was a point where I feel like I started to see them and I just wanted to just relax, <laughs> just relax and try to knit as I normally would rather than going too tight or too loose. And it's the other side just for, to, I feel like the other side looks better. It's the first, beginning of the round. That's my trouble spot usually. Yeah, those make ones can also kind of throw your tension off because, oh, for sure. yeah, if you're doing the make ones at the beginning and end of the round, then you're thinking about that instead of thinking about your tension for the magic loop or the flexi flip. So they can kind of contribute to the problem. But again, if it's yeah. mild, I'd be fairly confident it'll block out. But yeah. otherwise, you know, we will yeah. we'll be happy to help you figure that out. Generally, I feel like if it's bigger than this, like a quarter of an inch, then you want to. You want to yeah, we'll want to adjust your technique it. in some way yeah. to try to avoid that. Yeah. But anything smaller blocking should help. Yeah. All right. Um, we're wanting okay. to have some time for people to share their work. Yeah. Are there any other quick, quick questions or questions you think we should really get to before we start seeing everybody's sweaters? Um, real quick, um, because someone has a drop stitch and I, I know drop stitches can be scary, so I want to do that. Um, can I pick it up? It was Kristen. I dropped this stitch an inch below before my work, before I caught it. Can I pick it up or do I need to tear it out? Um, totally up to you. I will, if you have added the stitch back in, so you're back at the correct number of stitches. Um, you can't, if you've already knitted an inch, you can't really pick it all the way up to the needles because there's just no space left. Your stitches are right next to each other. There's no ladders in between that really have enough room to pick it up all the way to the needles. 
I uh, often will pick up those stitches as far as I can, stick a stitch marker in it so it won't unravel anymore. And then at the end of my sweater, when I'm finishing it, I'll just thread an extra piece of yarn through that stitch again to secure it, to keep it from unraveling weave in the two ends of those yarns so it's secured. It kind of depends um, what your comfort level, I guess, or expertise level with weaving in ends is. I do a lot of repairs, so I feel like when I do that, I feel like pretty confident that I can make it look like nobody will see it. Um, but it does take a little bit of tweaking, a little bit of finesse to you know get it to the right spot and weave in those ends so that you can't see it. If it's just an inch, uh, it might be worth going back um, and picking it up, but it's really up to you. It's definitely possible. And if you had done more than an inch, like if you were halfway through your sweater and you found a drop stitch yeah. at the beginning, I would definitely say, don't go back for that. Just, you know, put it on a piece of yarn and weave in your ends to fix it. Um, so it doesn't get worse. Um, but it's totally up to you. Sometimes if it's an only an inch, I will go back, um, just to, you know, get everything as perfect as can be. Um, but, it is possible to just fix it without going back if you want to give it a try. Thank you. And then one last question, if we have time. Mm -hmm. um, Jackie, I've started over twice due to short roll holes where the front and back joint. No issues with holes other than where the front and back joint. Pretty big holes that blocking will not help. Okay, so this is, well, uh, if it's the front and the back, I'm not sure if this is entirely the question. So when you do the wrap and turn, I'm, I'm guessing you did wrap and turn short rows. So when you do wrap and turn short rows, your final one, um, you pick up coming from the other way. So it's a curl wise wrap and turn short row, but then you knit all the way around. So you're kind of picking it up from the opposite side of where you normally would. If you check our wrap and turn, tutorial it has a special section at the end saying exactly how to pick that up because the the technique for picking up that wrap is slightly different when you're coming around from the other side um however i feel like that would only explain the hole at the beginning of the round i don't feel like that would explain the hole at the other edge of your work um so it's hard to say why that one's showing up unless it's because you have two wrap and turns right next to each other at that point because you'll be doing mm -hmm. I wonder if it's the two wrap and turns right next it would to each help other to see it I think again if you want to definitely email it to us yeah please do email us a here. picture or set up a one-on-one -on -one, one -on -one zoom help with us and mm -hmm. we'll take a look um Cause it's like, I know, I know why that first one's happening. I'm not sure why that second one's happening, but we can, we can figure it out with you. And I mean, that is one of the uh, benefits of German short rows is it doesn't suffer from that issue. You can knit a German short row together from either side and it looks the same. So you don't have to worry about doing a different technique when you're coming back around. Um, so that might be an option, even if it's just for those last couple of short rows right on the edges, do the substitute the German short row so that you don't have those holes. That might also fix it as well. All right, so cool. I think we're good. If there's anything else we didn't get to, we'll talk about how to reach us in the end. Um, but I think we're moving to show and tell time. <laughs> yes, I know we don't have as much today. Like we had so much to get through, but let's see some sweaters. Um, so we, I know last time we had some issues where people couldn't figure out how to raise their hands in Zoom. We have instructions, um, Gianna, if you could copy and paste those instructions into the chat. Um, and if you'd like to share your work, go ahead and raise your hand and Jaja will um, invite you on so we can see your sweater. All okay. right. And we're just going to try and highlight less people so you can see more at a time. All right. I see a hand. Um, do you want me to un undo Juliana, you and I? Just so you can um, see. No, you can, I think you can leave us on and then we can, okay. we can all chat. All right. So it looks all like right. Amy. I feel like I saw Amy the first time, the first meeting. Yes, and you did a private session with me, and you were very helpful. And oh Julie, my gosh, you yes! Answered about twenty thousand questions for me. Um, <laughs> so I have decided that if this does not make me want to lose weight, nothing will. There are so many, so many stitches on this sweater that I feel like <laughs> I'm never going to finish. But I've got my sleeves on. I'm doing the yoke. And um, I still don't feel like my numbers are gonna work out right for how many stitches I'll have at the end, but I'm just going for it to see. But these last 56 rows or whatever for the yoke take forever. 
They do. Once you get uh, your sleeves and your body together, it's, it's just, a lot. Just exponentially just but it also on. Yes. But also at the same time, you're decreasing every other row. So at least every row is getting shorter and shorter. It the doesn't end is feel inside. that way. I don't. <laughs> but anyway, it's almost looking like a sweater because it has yes. sleeves. Yay. I know that's very magical when you put it all together and all of a sudden you can see like, this is really going to be a sweater. It's not just three tubes. <laughs> and, and I figure even if I can never wear it, I've learned so much and I really appreciate all of your help. Oh, awesome. I'm so glad. Nice to, <laughs> nice to see your face, Amy. <laughs> yes. Thank you. I'm so happy. Awesome. <laughs> Super <All> proud. Right. <laughs> I just want to say, I saw in the chat, someone said that they tried the formula and it worked perfectly. So yeah. Oh, exciting. <laughs> I can't wait to try. I now I have to start a new project. Thanks, Jaja. You're welcome. <laughs> I'm an enabler. They also <laughs> we have. Hi, Tracy. Welcome. Hi. I like the idea of losing weight for a smaller sweater. And it gave me an <laughs> Nobody idea. has. No, yeah. no, 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 no. We, My daughter yeah. is tiny, tiny. She's a size zero, zero at 18 years see. old. She's little. So I'm going to next time do a practice sweater for her and then knit mine afterwards. But I was just going to show I've got the body. I'm ready to join my sleeves. I'm the one that had to restart because of the twisting over and over and over again. Oh, okay. I'm always looking for hints for that. So thank you. Cause I've been knitting forever, but I seem to do it at least once every time I try to do something in the round. So thank you so much. Thank I, you. I hope that helps. I mean, I, I have certainly been <laughs> very frustrated by twisting my work, which is why I've like experimented with lots of ways and like read up on lots of ways to avoid it. So I hope that helps. And <laughs> Yes, I'll but you towels and I'll twist it. I'll try to do a cowl in the in the round. And now I've gotten to where I just call it a Mobius, so that it's already it's supposed very, to be that is a totally valid. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't have to keep problem. restarting at Christmas time. So yeah, but thank but you, you for the help. I really appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome, and I'm glad you persevered. And now you're almost done with the body, and you're yeah. you're almost there. You're on your way. I'm getting there. Awesome. awesome. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Tracy. <laughs> We have Patricia. I think it's Hi, Sorry, Patricia. It's... There we go. <laughs> On mute. There we go. Hi there. Thank you so much for clarifying this for me. So I'm doing cattail silk. So mm -hmm. yeah, it is taking quite a long time. And I'm the one that messed up on all the short rows where I was not adding that extra oh, stitch that, on that the German one. short rows. Oh, so, wow. so yeah, so it ends up, it's a bit wonky. I was so pleased with it, but I said, I don't think something's right. Mm. So it was fine. But then look, you end up with like this on the other side. So I said, uh, I'm missing. I'm missing. Right. So th this is a live example of what happens. Yeah, it ended up sort of the alternate. It ended on up one side. Off yeah. center, and that's how I knew. I said something's not feeling right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Quick question. Uh -huh. When I'm ripping, instead of tinking 48 rows, which is going to take forever, mm -hmm. do I just run like um, uh, one of these? Uh, what do you call them? Like a rescue line through maybe before I did the fold, and then just rip. Absolutely. Yeah, I would uh, even if you can. Um, I would do it after the fold. Like I'm going to hold mine up. I don't know. If okay. So like you can see above the cording stitch, I yeah. would, if you could just in that row, right above the cording stitch, even if you were, I will sometimes um, put in my afterthought lifeline in a situation like this. If you like that, that row above the cording stitch is going to be hard to spot. Even mm -hmm. if you pick it up three or four rows above that, you can then, you know, rip it out up to there and then just tink out those last three rows. I often will do okay. that where I'll place my lifeline or mm -hmm. if I don't place the lifeline, cause I often don't yeah, I do as I say, one. not as I do, but I will, <laughs> if I have to rip something out and it's a lot, I'll take it off the needle. I'll rip a ton, but I stop before I know I'm done, you know, at least a couple rows, get it back on the needle. And then I tink those last couple rows so that, you know, I am sure I end in the right spot. I'm sure my stitches aren't twisted and I'm ready to keep going, but you at least save some time by ripping for as much as you can and then taking yeah. the last little bit. 
-hmm. and it won't affect the elasticity too much of my silk. But not of that. Not I don't think so. If you had already blocked it, or if you had machine washed to like a whole sweater and we're then unraveling it then you might have a little <laughs> bit of concern but if it's just been you know like a couple days or a couple weeks since you knitted it it should be totally fine thank you so much thank you oh, you're yes. awesome. thanks yes. patricia thank you for sharing <laughs> thank you and then i'm going to remove but i just wanted to maybe ask a moderator if you can add a note so that we can talk about an afterthought lifeline for next time because we hadn't really gone over that so i think that'd be something good to talk about yeah that would be our tutorial team is always looking for yeah. ideas and that's a good one mm -hmm. all right next up we have kate kelly kate kelly your name sounds very familiar have you emailed in before hold on i just no but i'm the one um i've been on here three times and chatted oh. i'm the one who oh. did uh zaza's um formula <laughs> the, the formula oh, it came out I that's mean, amazing that's so cool i'm so excited to try it <laughs> yeah, i I'd always rather it. have a little more than not enough <laughs> yeah i mean it just came out perfect um i did i finished my sleeves for my daughter what's today Th wednesday night and then i did a picture of her dinosaur eating her sleeves <laughs> oh yes cute I'm so excited <laughs> Awesome. Um, but yeah, I'm enjoying this. It's my very first garment, sweater, anything besides shawls or cowls. And it's awesome. <laughs> I'm so glad. It's such a great sweater. Like there's so many other people who are also knitting their first sweater. Um, I thought it was so funny. There's a, uh, a knitting designer we work with um, who, when we announced it, she reached out to us and she's like, she's a designer. She releases designs. And she reached out to say how excited she was because her first sweater had been the lightweight rattling pullover when we originally released it like seven years ago. I thought it was really sweet. It is a, it is a, a good project for learning new things. So I've been intimidated by sweaters and I've always wanted to do it. And I'm like, you know, what? I'm going to do it. And I'm having a blast. Awesome. I'm so glad. That's wonderful. All right. Well, thank you, Kate. Yes. All right. I think we can meet at least a couple more people before we run out of time. Sorry, I'm trying to. Looking for your raised hands. I'm, am I missing? Yeah. If you want to join us on yeah, screen, you can else raise your hand. If, if nobody else wants to, that's also fine. No pressure. <laughs> All right. I feel like I saw more before, but um, unless I'm missing that, I think we're good. Yeah. Um, I see. Maybe we have time for a couple more questions then. Okay. Let's look back at the. I'm going to just see. I see one in chat, which I think is a great question. My husband mm -hmm. wants a fingering weight sweater too. What Ooh. pattern or adjustments to this or another would you recommend? I actually feel like this is a great unisex sweater mm -hmm. um, because it is um, very simple. It doesn't have any waist shaping. Um, we have, uh, several, um, men who work at Pearl who are making the sweater along with us for themselves with, uh, the only mo modification you ha may have to make is that, um, I think many men tend to have longer arms than women. Uh, I have very long arms anyway, but, um, so you would just want to check, uh, his arm length and his body length against the schematic for selecting a size. And then maybe also um, he may prefer a slightly looser or baggier fit than we recommend in the pattern. So again, this goes back to, we've talked about this in past Zoom sessions. One way to figure out uh, what size to make is to measure an existing sweater that he has, you know, just lay it flat, med, take the chest measurement of that existing sweater and compare it to our finished sweater sizes to pick the one that's most similar so that you'll get the fit that he likes. I see. And Tracy, you have your hand raised again. Did you have another question? Oh, oh let me. Can you um, put Tracy on the screen, Jaja? Sure. Okay. Hi, Tracy. Oh, you I unmuted. unmuted your, you muted yourself again. I try try unmuting yourself one more time. Does it work? Okay. There we go. Um, on the cording stitch. I feel like mine doesn't lay like yours does. Can you see it? I don't, where's my camera? 
it it's like it rolls the opposite way. Did I pick it up wrong? I've not done this stitch before. It's hard to see it over the like it lays in a fold down and mine yeah. is like a bump. It should well, it is kind of a bump. Like if I lift it up, like yeah. you can see, like it is kind of a bump, but then it just sort of lays flat towards yeah. the bottom. Um it's you can it doesn't lay flat like that. It's just like a ridge that goes around it. I don't know if you can see that. It doesn't yeah, that actually like, looks yeah. all right to me. Does it it look could okay? that looks okay to me. Um, are you using linen quill? Yes. Or a different yarn. Okay. Um, it could be um a gauge difference. Did you check you checked your gauge and did a gauge swatch? Yeah, down a needle size, but yeah, I did I did too. Um, so I would suspect when you block it, it will look a lot better. And you can always test if you're ever not sure one of my like go-to tricks is to lightly steam block something. So, you know, don't touch it with your iron, but turn it on full steam and just sort of steam a little section. Um, if you need to, you can put your um, knitting on a piece of scrap yarn so that you're not steaming your needle cord too much. Um, and just take a look at it and make sure you're going to be happy with it before you go any further. Uh, from what I can tell from here, it looks okay. But again, you can always send us a picture and we'll take a closer look at it to make sure. Did you already do your space? So I kind of, I'm, I worry okay. that I pick things up different than other people do. I'm left-handed and I'm self-taught. So I kind of have a, my own method. It's not continental. It's not the regular, <laughs> it's just hodgepodge. But, um, so I worried that I pick up things opposite what other people would pick up. Ah, someone said maybe she picked up four down instead of five, like I did. That, that could does do it affect as well. how many, um, how how much that look right because if you didn't go for far enough down picking up that cording stitch um then it's a smaller ridge and it doesn't lay flat it kind of sticks out so that oh, could yeah. be it as well um but send us a picture and we'll take a look at it and okay. again even if that's the case i wouldn't take anything out i would steam it first um i'm not taking it out anyway i took it no, out don't take it out <laughs> it's staying like this yeah, also totally You've done fine. enough I work. <laughs> but for next time, time, I'd like to know. I'd like to do it right. So yeah, cool. All right, thanks. Thank Tracy. you. Uh huh. All of right. course. And okay. I think there's one more question. If we have to, oh, we're at two. We are so. right. If we can, let's squeeze in one more person. We'll go over by a couple minutes. If you have okay. to, if you have to leave, go ahead and leave. But we will yeah. uh, squeeze in one more person. Yeah, just since we had, it's a short yeah. question. But can you touch on amount of yarn needed? I am into my next game for my second sleeve, and wonder if I should order another one. So, um, I mean, we do have the exact yardages listed on the last page of the pattern. So definitely check that against what you have. General rule of thumb, and this is very, very general, is that the sleeves of a sweater take about 30% of the total yarn by weight. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's very general. And it's really hard to say if all you have done are the sleeves, whether you're going to have enough for the rest. It's even really hard, even when you're in like the raglan, because you're doing fewer stitches on each row. Sometimes it can be hard to tell if you are going to make it or not. Um, if in doubt, you can always order another skein of yarn. And as long as it hasn't been wound, you can return it for store credit. So I do think, and you can just, when you order in your order notes, say what the dye lot is and we'll look for the dye lot. Um, I always get an extra skein of yarn and bring it back if I don't use it. Cause I like to make my sleeves longer, my body longer. So I often need it. Um, and it just, it can't hurt to have an extra one and <laughs> send it back if you don't end up using it. Exactly. Oh, and then real quick question. Somebody said, if you've gone down a needle size, does that affect your yardage? No, as long as you've gone down a needle size in order to get the correct gauge. Yes. That's if your gauge is spot on and matches ours, your yardage should be spot on or very close to ours. Yeah. Um, so yeah. All right. That's perfect. Okay. I think we got through them all. We got through everything. Yeah. Um, <laughs> That was so much fun. Thank you all again for coming to our Zoom and Knit and for joining the Knit Along. Um, we love seeing everybody's sweaters. It doesn't matter where you are in the journey. Like we love seeing the finished ones. We love seeing the in progress ones. They're all wonderful. Um, I check in on our uh, our hashtag Pearl Soho K A L um, a couple times a week, and uh, this past week, a couple times I've gone in. Somebody will ask a question, and I see another knitter has already gone in and commented and answered it, and it's like 
it's it's a community how yeah. fun how wonderful is that helping each uh, other <laughs> yeah it's really lovely i love seeing that yep and if there's something that we didn't get to today maybe we missed it in the chat um or if you are working on it today and you come across something else just we're easily reachable <laughs> i would say the best way to contact us to get a fast response is by email you can email us at customer service at pearlsoho.com or knit along at pearlsoho.com i almost said that wrong <laughs> <laughs> um, and then we also have the one-on-one -on -one project help. If I don't think we'll have enough time, we can put it in the chat, but we're going to close the chat in a second. But if you just search help on the search bar on the website, it'll pull it right up and you can book a free appointment. Yes. And we will be having another Zoom meeting next month. Somebody just asked the date. Uh, I will tell you it's May 24th uh, at 4 p.m. Pacific time, 7 p.m. Eastern time. We're trying to vary the day of the week and the time. Um, so that as many people um, have uh, a chance to join us. Um, and this recording will also be on YouTube, hopefully by the end of next week, now that we've done it once and we know what we're doing. Uh, we'll get it up there <laughs> sooner, I hope. Um, yeah. And right. if you missed your question, just reach out. We are always willing to help, even if we didn't get to your question today. Mm -hmm. And. and I I have everything saved so we we can just double check and have everything ready for next time there's still plenty to go over we'll still yes. have to, <laughs> stuff to talk about oh can you see the time again she said uh 4 p.m pacific 7 p.m eastern um and i mean don't like we'll send out an email with all the information the invitation um i don't anticipate changing that but you never know but that's what we have it have it scheduled for at this time so okay. all right it was great okay. to see everyone yes new thank faces you. old faces this is this has been a blast <laughs> yes all right thank you all so much um stay in touch tag us on instagram send us your pics by email or in our gallery and we'll see you at our next zoom and knit yeah <laughs> bye bye